this, this, this is an opportunity that we thought would be very useful for us to, to share the, the, the ideas of the book, um, some of the thoughts, insights that we have um, gained while writing. Um, as, as we all know, the minute you start writing, you, you think of other projects that no, needs, no, to, needs happen to happen in order, in order to, to answer, answer the questions properly. Um, what we what we're going to do in in you know in this session is to um, to, sh to, to share, share with, with you, you the, the content, but also our way of thinking. Um, so we we're going to I'm going to ask uh, Frank to to start off with you know how this book came about. Um, it's, it's, it, it has like many other projects. Um, it's its own its own trajectory. So you end up writing a book without having decided at the start that what you're doing is going to end up in a book form. So it's it's, it's not one of those books that we had um, to call for papers. Um, it it developed organically from some of the from some of the activities. And I'll ask Frank to come and share that with with um, with you, and and then we can take you through. Uh, the the content of the the book, Frank. Uh, hello, everyone. It's, it's it's such a a great honor and delight to be in this space, to be sharing with you. Um, I have the easier task. It's nice way I'm talking about this book with our, my my partners in crime being together in one space. You know. Um, the last few times I've done it on my own and misrepresenting them. <laughs> so now this is an opportunity where we can, the three of us can talk about it, including uh, Esther uh, as a contributor. But I just want to say, uh, Professor, our talk by saying, how did this journey come about? Where did we come from? I also belong to a center called Environmental Humanities South which is one of the youngest centers at the University of Cape Town where we work. Um, we came together with a generous funding from Mellon, Andrew Mellon Foundation in 2015 to start a program where we could uh, have an interdisciplinary uh, sort of master's uh, or postgraduate program recruiting not just your normal run-of-the-mill students, but those who had been in the field, who had been in, you know, in the workspace and were engaging with issues and wanted to use multiple disciplines you know, uh, in looking at environmental issues beset on this continent. So one of the hubs in the uh, environmental humanities focused on what we at the time we called militarization of con conservation. So we had several discussions within that space, uh, which the three of us participated in, and um, our co-director of the Environmental Humanities South, Leslie Green, and James Mrombedzi, Dr. Mrombedzi, who is at African Policy Climate Center at uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. But before that, Manu and, our, and myself and others too, were really intrigued by the conservation space in relation to uh, the elephant that I will present in more detail a bit later about the state in natural resources in Africa. So we used to have so many lunches, discussions, drinks, and so on, including some of my colleagues from PLUS, Mafani Sohara, uh, Professor Muniba Isaacs, and, and others, about, you know, where do we take these discussions, you know, having frustrations about this space? called the state and natural resources in Africa, you know, so in, 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 in especially in the conservation space. So our ideas evolved in these conversations until with this large cohort of, um, you know, um, scholars we were working with in the environmental humanities space and who were finishing their dissertations, the idea of a book, of a collection came together. And the bulk of the contributions are actually from uh, students who were in that environmental humanities space uh, who could contribute chapters. 
And so this is the first book emerging from environmental humanities, but it's not just environmental humanities students, but other students that Mano was working with and outside of also UCT. And we thought, you know, let's have this collection. So through this uh, process, we managed to put together this collection, uh, uh, which morphed into the violence of conservation in Africa. But watch the space, there will be another book on African environmentalism that will emerge this year as well, or in the publishing processes from the Environmental Humanities Center with yet another cohort of you know, postgraduate students, practitioners, whatever you want to call it. So that's how the book came about. Back to you. Okay, thanks, Frank. Um, Maybe what will be of interest to, to the audience um, would be what, what, what is it that we're trying to do in, in, in this book? What, what are the theoretical angle that we, we have taken? What are the questions that made it possible for us to bring uh, people of diverse um, disciplinary backgrounds, um, some activists, um, lawyers, NGOs, into, into this common project. Um, what, what we observed, and, and um, some of you are already aware of this, is the, the nature of violence that has happened in, in Africa generally. And, 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 and we, we were, were trying, trying to, understand. to understand what drives this violence. Um, and why has this violence continued um, for as long as we could remember? Um, so th there's been colonial violence. It, it, there is violence in the post-independence um, era. And, and some of it is the same. And, and we, wondered, we wondered why, um, why this violence uh, does not, does not um, end. We also wondered why this violence has a demographic profile or character. Um, and, and this is not only in, in Africa, um, but of course we had to limit ourselves to what we could observe and in Africa and discuss. Um, and, and the violence, whether people are talking about building dams, uh, we've had in this morning mining, if you ask the question, who is the victim of this violence? It's the same people. You know, why are certain groups of populations always found on the wrong space of whatever order we want to create in the world? And so, so that's, that, that was um, a, a troubling question to engage with. Um, and then we needed to find entry points into engaging with, with this question. And of course, in places where, um, where um, uh, very overt uh, discriminations have taken place, we can always say, well, you know, this is racism. This is that and that. But I think it's beyond racism. I mean, the, the, discussion, the presentations we had this morning actually had in Uganda was, was, was terrifying. And, 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 and is the state just fighting its own citizens? and conservation spaces. And, and we wanted to really grapple with this question. Um, and we ended up, as you will see later in the presentations, the, 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 the kinds of themes that we generated that we thought would be very helpful for us to try and, um, and understand this, this, this violence. Um, so so part, 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 part of, of the... the to, so, so we ended up with, with four key themes in the book. Okay. Um, and, and one was to try to conceptualize dimensions of violence. Um, and without limiting violence to just one, one form or the other. And, and we know that there's material, non-material violence. Um, but but we, we wanted to tease out the other dimensions of, of violence so that we can... We can perhaps um, conceptualize, try to conceptualize violence 
And, and the idea of trying to conceptualize violence was not, was not simply an academic exercise. We, we wanted to understand later on what a non-violence conservation would require conceptually. You know, how do we, how do we conceptualize non-violence? What are the theories of violence that we should draw on to understand the violence that we see on the ground? So, so that's, that's one of the aspects that we needed to grapple with. And, and of course, at the time, as Frank has just said, we had a, we had a, a group of um, students who were um, trying to grapple with militarization of conservation. And, and we thought, you know, we'll give them a space to deal with that. Um, it was, and still is, a very hot topic. Um, and uh, there are authors in the room here who have grappled with, with this. Um, so so we, we looked at that from different uh, contexts. But what was also interesting for us is, is the local impact of this and, and the agency that is beginning to come from the ground to deal with, with the violence. Um, and in the book, we have, uh, we have one case study uh, in Mozambique, um, which deals with, um, with, with what, uh, in official terms, there will be poachers. But the locals call them the heroes. Okay? Because they, they, they were doing something. Um, they were using the resources from this trade to, 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 assist, um, to, to, to assist communities and so forth. And, and they, they were also using different norms of, of, of understanding human behavior. Um, and and we, we were challenged by, by our reviewers, uh, people who reviewed the book. Um, and, and we said, oh, now we've had all of this. So what are the alternatives? Okay. Uh, pushing us to think of, about nonviolence. Um, first, conceptually, you know, how do we conceptualize nonviolence? Um, and, and we had to then engage with proposals that are on the table, and, and I'll come back to this later on, to try and, and understand what the alternatives could be. Um, and we needed to avoid a particular trap that we could imagine people reading the book would think we're doing, that you know, we want to stop poaching, we want to stop um, people who are fighting against the poachers. And we said, no, that's actually, that's an action. We, we want to think about nonviolence. And we are not the first people to think about nonviolence in conservation. Um, other other uh, disciplines, other scholars have long thought about nonviolence. The nonviolence movement across the world have used particular lenses of nonviolence to push for change. Would that be helpful for us to think in conservation spaces? So, so that's, that's um, the, 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 my, 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 uh, my colleagues here are going to, to speak to some of these, um, uh, these, 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 these themes, uh, perhaps in, in more detail. But I, I thought I would give you a sense of what, 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 what are the key things in the book. And, and later on, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to, to share with you what, what, what our own um, conclusions are. And I will say this is a preliminary conclusion because it's not the end of the book. <laughs> um, and, and, and most of you would know that once you come to the end of the book, you realize you actually you need to do more work to continue. Uh, and, and that's why uh, people retire as academics because they keep, you know, they, they keep pushing the lines and, and asking and answering questions. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to, um, to ask, um, uh, Frank to, to to speak to 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 one of the one of the key themes here on 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 on, on conservation. Um, see if I can I can have one of them here. Um, it's, sorry, it's not showing now. Don't know what's going on. Okay, there it comes. Um, and and so so we identified four conditions. Um, and there could be more, but these are sort of the, the, the entry points that we've used, the four conditions that we think um, will make violence in conservation a permanent feature. And, and of course, there are already questions about, you know, why would we say something is permanent? 
you know, we should be we should be working for change. But the idea is that unless you change these conditions, um, we don't see we don't see how how conservation is not going to be violent, especially on this continent. And and and, and we all know the the human and human. Um, divisions and, and the consequences from that, but we, 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 we don't think that we have done enough to understand um, the divisions within, within people themselves. Um, and in this case, we do focus on, on, on black people uh, on the continent. Um, we have used the concept black to as, 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 a broader, as a broader concept to, to include um, as many people. In the book, we sometimes even add um, indigenous groups um, because we, we know the, the terminologies don't mean the same thing. Um, we avoided using people of color because we are writing from where blackness is more, is more uh, appropriate. Um, one of my students doesn't like the concept of people of color, is, it says um, everybody has a color of some sort. And, and so, so, so we, we have used this. But um, we also realize that uh, the global environmental agendas are a critical part of, 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 of the, the, I mean, the root of violence has to do with that um, in some ways. Um, and, and resource sovereignty, especially on the African continent, is, is a very key part. Um, and, and obviously, we needed to link um, what most people in the room have written about already on the neoliberalization of nature, but to link that to violence um, so that it's not just the commercialization part, um, the, the, the privatization part of it, but it's the consequences of this process on, on people and, and using the, the lens of violence to speak to this. So um, the, the three speakers are going to uh, take us through this, this, uh, uh, these conditions. Um, I, I know that when we say violence will remain a permanent feature of conservation in Africa if these conditions remain the same, um, we, we are not ignorant, we, we are not undermining any possibilities for change. Actually, we're doing so in order to ensure that uh, we tackle these as, 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 as important aspects. Um, so Frank, over to you to, to speak about resource sovereignty. Thanks. So, there's, as Manu has already pointed out, one of the key issues is the role of the state in Africa, particularly for these contested natural resources. And <clears throat> as you can see, it's not a single authored contribution these are some of the student scholars we were working with, or I, we were thinking together in trying to deal with this issue of uh, resource of renting <coughs> in the role of the state in Africa. Oh. Yeah, okay. So what I'm, we'll talk about here is the issue of state and natural resources in Africa, <coughs> and as I've already said, and we framed it using two theses that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, to, to frame this uh, contribution. But already the speakers this morning were alluding to the fact of continuities um, in, in practices within Africa by state, uh, states. This is the question I guess you could say, oh, Shion Bembe has already written about the post-colony, Franz Fanon before that, etc., etc. But we were trying to bring it to the natural resource space to say, what is going on here? as I said earlier, that these were issues that we were grappling with for quite a long time. And how does it facilitate violence you know, in these spaces? But of course, we drew up uh, on, on cases from uh, Zanzibar uh, in Tanzania, Gonare Show National Park across the border, and not far from here, Dwesa Tweve, Cromwell, you might uh, know about these uh, spaces. So, but I won't go into detail so much, but I want to focus on these two, two theses that we used in framing the idea of how the state operates in these spaces and facilitate violence. One is this huge elephant in the room that Manu will come back to about coloniality. 
Some people say, oh, but we're post-colonial and so on. Coloniality is a praxis, it's a praxis. You know, it's embedded. And we see it particularly in the way natural resources Afri um, uh, operate in Africa. Where do the ideas come from? Now we are grappling with this issue of 30 by 30. Manuel has already said these conversations are con continuing. And today, when we talk about 30 by 30, green economy, where are those ideas generating from? Where is the African state to define where it, they want to go? Who is defining these things, these agendas, these green agendas? Is that where the African state wants to go? It emerges from, from somewhere else. A few weeks ago, we were getting an example, we won't mention from which state bureaucracy, about even funding for, 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 for these sort of ideas, even for states with the fiscal capacity to do so. So now, if you allow, if I always use this example, if, if, you, if you give somebody space like that, they will take it up. And this is what uh, we find in terms of knowledge, but also in terms of this issue about property. We are plagued with this notion that there's always this underlying assumption that unless property is owned in certain ways or defined in certain ways, and again, this is coloniality. Once we had people landing on these shores from somewhere else, Africa's way of commoning and looking at resources and sharing was permanently disrupted. And this is the fight, back, you know, thanks to the fight that we hear by examples of people from Kolobeni, and et cetera, et cetera, in trying to regain this, you know, to decolonize, essentially. But our states are facilitating this coloniality in terms of these notions about property. Somebody was speaking about the idea of who benefits from and who can access resources. It's plagued by this coloniality, these notions about property that are alien to this continent fundamentally. Even if you may say, yeah, people have private homesteads and private lands to farm, but it's not, you have usufruct rights that get passed on. That way you don't leave anybody out. This is how violence gets, gets perpetuated through this practice of coloniality. I could go on, sorry, I, I'm now sounding like a, a, a lecture, in not a, a conversation, sorry. The second thesis that, that we are talking about is this notion of bifurcation that Mamdani has talked about, uh, which facilitates this violence. Yeah. Manu, you've already mentioned that how black populations are treated on the continent. You know, in certain spaces, it's really problematic or poses huge questions in terms of how particularly rural populations and rural populations where resources are supposedly to use this notion, valuable or valued in certain ways, right? Which con then constitutes in the way citizens in those particular spaces are then treated. We opened the book with the case of the Mas Masoka Jai in Congo, right? You know, in terms of the way they were treated. Is this bifurcation? But if black populations happen to live in Glenwood, yeah, they are citizens, we will consult, we will deal. But the moment you begin to go Mlazi and out and further, Mlazi is a, is a black township here in Deben or Etequini, the further you go away from the center, the less those populations are treated like citizens, there's no way. That's the fundamental point we are making, which results in an uneven state experience. Cromwell sitting there was earlier talking about in the morning, how they are not consulted about where the road should go, but they are the ones who are supposed to be benefiting from that end to highway. That's, that's a challenge that we already see some of the ideas we generate in the story. Uh, you have to stop me when you are ready. So, so I just wanted to highlight, yeah, earlier in the morning we were, um, if I can get it to point, is the star? Okay. Uh, I can't, oh. Eyes are gone. Yeah, so um, we, we, we started off somewhere around here, right? Cromwell? Yeah, that's where um, 
Kolobeni is. We are up here in Deben. So if we continue south on the coast, we'll come to a place here where we've been working for a few years called Dwesakoevi. This, from somewhere around here anyway, going down, it's called the Wild Coast. Uh, very beautiful landscapes uh, uh, that you find in those parts, and they look something like this. Oops. I'm just waiting here to breathe. Yeah. If, look, you can see um, this is the Mbashe River emptying its waters into the sea. By the way, this is a marine protected area besides being a nature reserve as well. So that's the landscapes we are talking about uh, in Dwesa Koewe, just to give an example of how this is operated in that space. Uh, Dwesa Koewe was one of the first nature reserves or forest areas or conserved spaces, protected areas in South Africa to be given back to communities that had been, that, who had been dispossessed of it during colonial and apartheid times. Right. Fast forward to what year are we in 2023 now? You would then think, oh, everything is now hallelujah. But as you see in the picture, this is an illegal activity going on here. This. Yeah. Yes, they are not supposed to be there. It's a protected space. Unfortunately, I'm not showing a picture where it says even trespassing. Who's trespassing? Hmm? You see the coloniality of practice that I'm talking about in, in this Dwesa Koewe. Because of this forest that, you know, roads companies wanted to pillage. This is why it was set aside. But it was set aside to protect from who? Hmm? From white settlers who couldn't find gold. Huh? But today, you know, that space is still protected. Despite the fact that the land rights, the land titles actually belong to the communities of uh, Dwesa Kwewe, but they do not hold that title. Because the state has retained control over that same space. And are still treating as uh, populations around Wesa Kwewe as non-citizens, as not knowledgeable. Despite their struggles, it is documented the fights that they have had since 2000 when the land was supposed to be given back to them. Yeah? So, oh, yeah. Uh, these are the sort of um, rustic uh, chalets that people are supposed to go, discerning tourists are supposed to go and enjoy ecotourism in that space. Uh, but as we speak, while it is community owned, the monies that are supposed to be accruing from this space is not necessarily realized by the communities there. They are still involved in struggles that are ongoing. Now, without taking too much space, I just want to draw and highlight that post-colonial states in Africa continue to pro practice coloniality and bifurcation over natural resources through this hierarchical way uh, knowledge is shared. In fact, most communities or populations around these protected areas are considered non-knowable. People use technical jargon like biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera, species, species, species and all these kind of terms. And populations are treated as subjects in these spaces. So, quoting Fanon, we we'll conclude by saying post-colonial states mirror the violence that was perpetrated against them by colonialism and need to ask whether the time has come to usher completely new pathways. That's the question that we pose in that contribution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, um, for, 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 for sharing the, you know, part of the chapter. Um, and I'm going to ask Tafaja to, to come and, and present. Okay, so um, I'm going to be speaking about protected forests as wildland forests, um, obviously inspired by the work by Peluso and colleagues that have worked on violent environments. So uh, this comes uh, from chapter five of the book, 
that talked about uh, violent forest, local people, and the role of the state um, in Zimbabwe. And this chapter focused on Sikumi Forest Reserve, um, which is a protected forest managed by uh, the Forestry Commission in Zimbabwe. And um, it's one of the 21 uh, indigenous uh, forests that have been set aside for protection in Zimbabwe. So why did I think about or even write about protected forests as violent forests? Precisely because of what we're seeing here, exclusion of communities from economic development opportunities. This is a typical homestead um, in the villages that surround Sikumi Forest Reserve. So many villages that, in fact, Sikumi is sort of like a buffer zone. It's, right, it's sitting right, right next to Wange National Park, so it buffers Wange National Park from the communities that live um, after Sikumi. And this is the kind of homesteads that you see um, when you move around communities that, that live uh, adjacent the forest. You can see the type of dwellings. It's pole and dagger and thatch grass. And you can see that they really rely on resources just to make shelter, which is a basic you know, human, rights, human right. So I want you to compare that picture and this picture here. That's Ganda Lodge. It's operated by the Forestry Commission inside Sikumi Forest Reserve for photographic safari uh, business, tourism. That's Elephant Eye Lodge. Operated, operated by German Safaris, which is a South African company, uh, and that's a private concession inside Sikubi Forest Reserve. Um. The third picture is another, yet another private concession. Uh, it's Ivory Lodge. So there are about four, the other pic, uh, picture I did not share, but there are four uh, photographic safaris within the forest. And I want you to go to booking.com right now and, and search and make a booking. <laughs> you are going to pay 650 US dollars per person per night, right? To enjoy this beautiful landscape. So just imagine how much money this lodges, this business is this, you know, are making out of this space. And then think of that picture, the first picture that I showed you of the communities that, that stay outside. The separation is so distinct, you, you don't even need anyone to tell you the story. It, it's, so, it's sort of the story is out there for you to see, right? Um, I don't know why it keeps doing this. That team can help us. And then it's also violent because uh, whilst this business is, uh, the ecotourism businesses are making money, millions of dollars per year, whatever, communities are being limited to low value resources, right? So they can come and harvest stage grass, they can come and harvest timber, for construction timber, firewood. But even at that, these low, low value resources are controlled by a stringent permit system. So this permit system has got a long list of don'ts, more than it has a list of do's. So for instance, if you want to collect construction timber, you, you normally get a permit for three days. And within three days, you're supposed to be able to look for the, uh, the timber that you want, to cut it, and to carry it. And in the first picture, you saw that uh, the homestead has got a fence, right? And it's poles. Imagine how much of those you need. And can you collect that in three days? Because this is a permit that you will not get like several times, probably get that once in a month or, you know, depending on the mood also of the security guards that sort of control this space, you know. And then the touch grass also is a seasonal product. So women, only women are allowed to go and collect touch grass. So they go out. And if you look carefully at the bundles of uh, touch grass, you see that there are two rolls and inside there's some sort of space. So this is where the women stay overnight, because they have to go, it's far away the grass is, so they have to go and stay there, lodge there, and stay in between those two stacks for a shelter until they're done with the collection. Sometimes, if, if they're fortunate enough, they have a guard that looks after them, but sometimes they're just by themselves, and this is an area that has the big five and all the other dangerous animals. 
So it's also violent because of the violent policing that goes on inside the forest. Remember I said that um, collection of resources is by usually a permit system, so you need to stick to the rules of the permit. If you disobey those permit rules, you'll be in big trouble. So this violent policing, and it usually involves excessive use of um, violent arresting tactics by paramilitary guys. So the two pictures that I put for you there carry long, long stories of violence and repeated violence. Uh, this, can I point? Okay, so the picture that is sort of on my right, topish, with those three men, those guys are carpenters, right? They make a living through, uh, they make doors, stools and stuff to sell. But the type of wood that they need to do that is the wood that is prohibited. So it's the high value commercial timber, your mukwa, your tick, because it makes good furniture, you know. But they're not allowed to touch that. They can touch any other, but they cannot touch this high value um, timber. So these guys, they disobeyed the rule, they went in without a permit, and then they were caught inside. And you can guess what happened. They were in big trouble, they were beaten like to death, almost to death. In fact, they had a dog, and the dog was shot on sight. And that, I remember them telling me how that affected them so much. You know how a dog is a man's best friend, and just seeing it being shot on sight, like, you know? So now they're out of business. They have to look for something else to do to make money. Then the other picture at the bottom-ish, it's not very clear, but somewhere there with the red T-shirt is me. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sitting in between those two gentlemen and they, are, they identify themselves as hunters. I also identify them as hunters, but the Forestry Commission responsible for this forest sees them as poachers. And this has been, these guys have been constantly, uh, they have been arrested several times. How did I get to know that? I just went to the forest guard and they gave me a list of, uh, like, a, sort of a record of arrests and their names appeared so many times. I said, I need to get these guys. I need to speak to them. <laughs> so I looked for them, um, and fortunately I found them, and I spoke to them, and they told me sad stories of how they've experienced, how they've received their own share of violence. And for them, it's usually through an informant system. You know, forest guards work with uh, informants who tell them that, you know, so, so and so is selling meat, we suspect it's, it's, it's game meat um, or it's bush meat and then you know, they come at night, they raid. So for, this, for the guys, for the carpenters, it was an ambush. So they were just ambushed whilst doing you know, the operation. For the hunters, it's usually a raid. So they are raided at night, dragged out of the house naked, beaten up in front of their children, in front of their, uh, of, of their spouses, in front of their wives. So, and this, this has been going on. The family that's sitting, so the man that's sitting with, with his wife and kids, they actually have an older son who has refused to stay with, with his parents because this guy said, we're not going to stop hunting. We will continue hunting. So they are constantly being raided. And you know, it's a repeated story of violence every time. So their older son has decided to just go and stay with his grandparents. I mean, because he, he just can't take it. He just can't take you know, the experiences of violence every time. Oh, uh, so Sukumi, I also found it violent because of the kind of working conditions and working and living conditions of the forest guards. Um, this, uh, this is, I think this is a leopard. I hope I'm correct, because I'm always confused between leopard and cheetah. <laughs> Well, I think this is the leopard. So we found this uh, during one of the patrols. Obviously, it, you see that it has got a wire. It, is, it was you know, caught in one of the hunter's snares, <laughs> not the poacher's snares. So we took that uh, on our way back to the station, and I thought, oh, we're taking it because you know, it's, it's going to be exhibit. It's going to be evidence that you know, we found something in the forest. But look, but look what's happening there. Those guys are now preparing that for the pot. In Zimbabwe, I guess there are a lot of Zimbabweans in the room, we don't eat any, any cats. Anything that is in the cat family is not food, right? 
So to see them preparing this for the pot, it should tell you something about their living conditions and you know, perhaps their salaries are not enough for them to you know, properly for provide for their families. So now they're turning to uh, you know, this kind of bush meat. Sometimes they, they get elephant meat, like if, it's a, if, they, if, if they do test and they see that it's not cyanide, the, the elephant is died because not of cyanide, it's a, it's a bullet, they can you know, share the elephant meat. But when there isn't that, they resort to eating this, which is really unusual, right? Two, oh my God. And then that is um, a forest guard in his dressing shoes that he should be wearing to church. They are not given proper PPE, protective uh, equipment, personal protective equipment. When I, were, when I was working with these guys, uh, uh, Elephant Eye Lodge had, had donated uh, boots, safety boots, and uh, they were short of two pairs, and still the Forest Commission could not buy those two pairs for the, for the forest guards. So it just shows how, how the state is not really concerned about the welfare of their guards. I'm also just going to quickly show you that is the armory, and those are the guns that they use. These guns are not serviced. The biggest shock of my life is discovering that on, during one of the, uh, the, the, the anti-poaching exercises, the two guns that we had had one bullet each. One bullet each in a gun that has not been serviced for I don't know how many years. And this is the gun is their first line of defense and it's not serviced, no bullets. So these guys are in danger. So no one is safe. Even the perpetrators of violence are also violated. They've also you know, experienced some sort of violence, right? Then you have the, the state pushing a different, selling a different narrative outside, right? It says, this was in 2019, it says, the Forest Commission, is ex it was exhibiting along, uh, on the sidelines of AU, UN Africa Wildlife Summit, and the summit runs under theme communities harnessing conservation, tourism, supporting governments. And this resonates with, well with, um, with renewed efforts to ensure that communities derive benefits from sustainable forest management. How? When you're doing exactly the opposite on the ground. That's them, people, forest, and wildlife. There is that recognition that people, forest, people need forest and wildlife, and wildlife and forest need people. But then, that's also another recognition of that. And then comes the national forest policy. This is the latest document in Zimbabwe right now. For the past, I don't know how many years Zimbabwe has operated without a proper forest policy. This is the first one. And then it says, we are going to maintain the integrity of forest and we are going to extend gazetted areas to include those catchment areas, steep slopes and other vulnerable sites. So if there are people that are staying in those areas, they're in trouble. They are gone. They're going to be removed. Then it says, okay, but we also want to devolve power in your and you want to make sure that there's benefit sharing. And then the policy action for that is that the state says we're going to decentralize authority to local authority, RDCs, which is the rural district councils and traditional leaders, which is problematic. I mean, there are many studies that have been done. Frank has done studies, um, witness has also done work on that. How this is problematic, how you can, how you let the local elite, uh, you know, uh, be the representatives of people's needs because most of the times they, they fail to do that. So I just want to end with this slide. After the policy came out, I was very excited. And in fact, I was very happy because at least now we have a proper policy. And I scheduled immediately an interview with uh, one of the executives from the Forestry Commission and I asked him what he thinks about the 30 by 30 deal for nature. And in his long response, this is what he said. He said it's a good policy thrust. It is something that the state can work on. But it would require the state to have a formula on the growing population, perhaps see people moving from rural areas to urban areas in order to increase area under protection. Then he recognizes, he recognizes that it's going to be difficult to strike a balance on this, but there are certainly certain areas that, they, that the state can include into the protected forest area system. So I was just left without any emotion, I think, after the interview, and I said, okay, so what, what really is the role of the state? Is it to protect 
people? Is it to protect its citizens? Is it to protect nature? Is it to protect nature for its own benefit? What really is the role of the state? I think I'll just, um, because of time, and also this is my last slide, end it here, and hope to have more discussions after that. Thank you very much, Tafazwa. Um, now we will move straight to Esther, uh, who will briefly take us to the Congo. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, you can imagine I was quite thrilled when I got the invitation to contribute to this book or by this trio. So I think I never replied as quickly to an email, Mano, uh, when you asked me to contribute, uh, with uh, definitely saying yes. Uh, so it's really an honor also to be here to present uh, uh, this great work you have done to pull everyone together. Um, my chapter in the book is about uh, the coloniality of crisis conservation. With crisis conservation, I'm meaning the increasing uh, transnationalization and militarization of conservation in conflict areas, in specifically in war regions. Um, and I see, well, we have a lot of these spectacular media representations of what a risk it is to save nature on the front lines of war, and that you really need strong heroes. Uh, uh, this better. Yeah, so... In those contexts, uh, in, in the, so while we can very much focus on the spectacular current uh, images of the, the noble war that is saving uh, wildlife on the front lines uh, of war, this is actually embedded with, in a colonial history of conservation. So within my chapter, I uh, explore uh, basically the colonial roots of uh, how we come to this current situation in Vrunga National Park, where uh, Emmanuel de Merode um, got the authority to manage the park and to, uh, by uh, his organization, increasingly the transnationalization and militarization of the park. The second one. Ah, yeah. It's. So what you're seeing happening here is, well, um, you see a form of white authority white authorized green finance emerging in these spaces where nature needs to be protected of, of, of war. Uh, and while um, Mano and Bram uh, uh, published this influential paper on green violence, we see in many areas, and specifically conflict regions as Congo, where this violence is actually only authorized if it's ordered, uh, instructed, and, and led by white people, white men, to be precise. Um, so here you see the military trainings that are being done under this militarization. Uh, uh, that's why if you're talking your, your work on occupational violence against the park guards, you, you mentioned the shoes. If you manage, if you see here in the picture to the right, they don't even wear shoes. Well, they have to carry the white men uh, as, as, as an exercise. So you see a conflation, you see, um, Within Congo, you see it's not clear anymore for civilians, but also for rebel groups, to distinguish who is actually a par guard and who is actually a soldier. Actually, par guards are being put on the front lines of war, and they become actually a, a, a target of war. When rebel groups are targeting uh, the Congolese army in, uh, as part of the, of, of the war that's going on in eastern Congo, and the par guards are working together with the Congolese army, they are actually becoming targets uh, of war. And we are, ex we are really putting these black bodies uh, at risk uh, to contribute to this, to this naval, noble war of, of saving wildlife uh, during, during com conflict. <coughs> but uh, I, I will have the... the the risk of repeating myself because I've, I've talked already a few times about Vrunga. So I think uh, uh, avoiding that risk, I, I want to draw the bigger stories that is, that is going out here and that is about Vrunga and Eastern Congo. I think it's, um, it's, 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 it's a magnifying glass because what, everything what's happening there uh, is to an extreme. But we see these processes of militarization and transnationalization uh, of, of militarized conservation in, in, in different areas and in different uh, uh, what I call conservation in, in dangerous spaces. And um, what we see happening 
in war areas or uh, areas where jihadis are taking increasingly power or where rebel groups are increasingly uh, active, you see these colonial anxieties around the loss of nature are being heightened. During these kind of episodes of political unrest, of, um, of uh, increased violence against humans, uh, we see these colonial anxieties around um, uh, being heightened around environmental destruction, about landscape de uh, degradation, about wildlife, wildlife depletion, and this is creating some kind of a crisis narratives that are actually increasing, uh, appealing to our moral duty to actually intervene and to continue intervening, and that we should not stop when war is entering an area, we should not stop conserving nature in this area. We should actually step in even more and actually uh, exacerbate uh, our, our efforts. So this is really the narrative that, um, <coughs> that, that we see in, in more what I, uh, conservation in, in different dangerous spaces. What is also at the same time, uh, not a lot of research is being done in these areas. So while we see increasing public-private partnerships where international NGOs are taking over the management of these places uh, within so-called unsafe areas, war zones, ungovernable spaces, and these NGOs are stepping in, there's also less accountability in these areas. So we see parks is like where not a lot of research is being done, also with us as political ecologists. Sakuma so in Chad, in Central African Republic, parks are being taken over by public-private partnerships. Um, African, um, African parks are taking over now two parks in South Sudan. Uh, African parks is going into more of these dangerous war zones. Uh, and um, and they're also, by doing so, these areas are difficult to reach. There's less media coverage. And we as researchers, also we as political ecologists, go to these areas less. We are sticking often to southern, eastern Africa. But if we go look to the literature on West and Central Africa, for example, we see way less scrutiny of what is actually going on. Um, and I think the Democratic Republic of the Congo is kind of an uh, extreme example again, where now uh, of the seven national parks that are present in, in the DRC, five of them have a white European or uh, American director. Um, and I think there are no other countries in the world where you see this extreme transnationalization of authority of conservation. If you know any other examples, please let me know. But I think uh, Congo is kind of extreme and it's built on these colonial um, narratives and imaginaries as Congo is this impossible place. Congo is the dark of hardness where you really need these white people uh, to, to, to come in. Uh, so what I say, like this kind of conser conservation in dangerous spaces is creating a lot of opportunities, new frontiers for international conservation NGOs to, to increase their zones of influence, to carve out zones of authority, and also to reclaim, again, some moral superiority as the ult ultimate sacrifice, which is also often embedded in a lot of masculine ideas about uh, this, this idea. Also... Uh, often when I'm in conversation with, with them, often assuming that me as a woman could not even do, or they were even assuming that I did not do any field research in these areas, and that they actually know how it is. Like, you're so naive, you have no idea. And I'm like, ah, you, you, should, you should know. But, um, so uh, African Parks here in South Sudan is really calling this building a new frontier of conservation, say this kind of forgotten landscapes that we need to control, that we need to understand through this mass wildlife monitoring. I don't know, they are do making deals with the current South Sudanese government. I don't know how ethical uh, we can, uh, could label this, uh, these kind of partnerships. Uh, another area where Conservationists are increasing their, their efforts. Their presence is in Karamoja. It's the northeastern part of, of Uganda, bordering South Sudan and Kenya. And here conservation actors are increasing the focus on conservancies, of creating some kind of a transboundary conservation project with Kenya. All well, at the same time, there's a heavy crackdown on uh, armed uh, pastoralists in the area. There's a heavy insurgency, counter-insurgency operation happening in Karamoja. So in, um, but you see how the conservationists are dealing with this political 
instability and insecurity, they are actually using it as an opportunity. And well, uh, many people don't really realize what is going on in Karamoja at the, at the moment, uh, at least the Kidepo, um, other direction, the Kidepo Valley National Park is nominated as a world uh, travel award because you can fly in and out out of Kidepo Valley National Park to increase, the, to look at the wonders while not being confronted with a counterinsurgency outside of the park and where cons uh, conservationists are now increasingly uh, stimulating the idea of, of uh, uh, elephant corridors and, um, and uh, conservancies. So I want to also call upon you that we need to look how conservationists are using danger, dangerous spaces, war zones as a form of new influences. Why do they go into these areas? Uh, I don't really have a lot of uh, answers to that, but I think uh, these questions are interesting and that we also should not shy away for us doing research in these areas um, and to follow up on, on kind of this new frontier of, of conservation uh, in Africa, uh, which is emerging in some kind of form of conservation warscapes. Um, and, and in these conservation warscapes where current forms of war and violence, but also where also past forms of violence and colonialism uh, linger on in, 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 in the social environmental relations that people have with these areas, but they continue uh, and how this interacts and how, how this interacts with conservation actors, conservation priorities, and how actually uh, one does, conservation doesn't only uh, influence the war, the, the war escapes, but the war escapes also influences the ideas and practices of the conservation, uh, the conservation machinery. And I think uh, it's good to do more research on this. So. Okay, thank, thank you very much, um, Esther, for, for that presentation. Um, now, I, I, I just want to, we've got a bit of time to ask questions, but I just want to, um, to go to, um, you know, the, the last part of the book has to do with rethinking nonviolent conservation. And, and, and here, um, we, we, I, I know we had trouble when we were putting this together. Um, I, I remember one of the colleagues saying, um, oh, we've got, you know, people have got these guns and they're shooting people. I mean, that is what we need to deal with now. <laughs> for, for, and it was very difficult for us to, to, to think beyond what we see. I mean, this, these are horrible stories. But we needed to, to get a sense of, 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 of nonviolence. And in order to, to think through that, we had first to reject uh, the violence nonviolence uh, duality um, because um, each of these will have its own implications on how we think about about violence and 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 if we were influenced by by the work of butler who 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 has um, gone back to you know some of the uh, nonviolence uh, or even peace, peace movements and and the ideas that they developed over time and, and, and that was very useful for us to think about nonviolence in, in a different way. And, and we came to, um, to, to, to this view um, that nonviolence as, um, should be conceptualized as a set of conditions that not only prevent the use of force that leads to harm, but that also render its use an irrational approach to human interactions and relations. So, so that's, 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 that's our observations about, about violence. And our thinking about this, as I said, was, was being influenced by um, looking, into, um, looking into violence in, 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 in different ways. And, and one of the, one of the um, perhaps, sorry, I'm still seeing something there. Okay. So, so, yeah, this is where I was coming to. Thanks, uh, Tafazza. Um, that, you know, Butler made a very, a very useful intervention in, in, in thinking about nonviolence. And it was not in relation to conservation. 
um, that we, we should reject the reductionist conception of nonviolence um, as uh, passivity, as withdrawal, and, but, but think about that in the traditions of Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and, and there are others that, um, that we can look into to suggest that, and, and, and we found this quite useful, that there are forceful and effective modes of action that gain their force precisely by refusing violence. And, 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 and this just made us to begin to think about what will be, what will be a way of thinking about nonviolence in, in conservation. And, and this, is, this is sort of towards the end of, of, of the book where we're grappling with. Uh, and and we, we came to, um, to we, make, we made a few propositions and, and one is that um, we, sh we, should, we should contextualize nonviolent conservation within the broader understandings of nonviolence itself. Um, of course, we can have a specific view on, on that. And, and we made three uh, proposals on, on what we think are the preconditions for a nonviolent conservation. And this is thinking um, not, not, not at, on the ground, on you know, how do you stop things on the ground, but how, do we, how, how did we come to see things that we see on the ground? What, what, what are the ideas? Uh, maybe put aside the policies. We know the policies are flawed. But what are the ideas that generate the kinds of actions that we see on the ground? And how do we grapple with those ideas? How do we, as scholars, as we, you know, most, most of us are in the lecture theaters, rooms, you know, how do we, how do we colonize conservations by the way we make students think about what is causing the things we see on the ground. And that's a hard work in some ways. Um, you know, very often and, you know, when we follow discussions on decolonization, it's, it's mostly about, um, we know that uh, Mignola and the group, they've sort of led the discussions and everybody is trying to bring the discipline into how do I decolonize chemistry? <laughs> how, do I, how do I decolonize maths and so forth? And now they talk about green chemistry and so forth. But I think what's important is, is to grapple with those ideas, where things come from, and, and to deal with them. So um, we'll, we'll stop there in the interest of time and, um, and, and take some questions. So, so thank you to uh, um, Esther, Frank, and, and Tafaja. Um, so I'm going to invite you to answer the questions. Um, all the soft questions can come to me, and they will deal with the hard questions. <laughs> okay, any, any, any question? Um, anything that we have said that you would like to engage us on? It's always good to, you know, to challenge ideas. Any thoughts? The two hands there, is there a rowing, rowing mic? Anybody to help us with the rowing mic? Esther, um, I have a question for you, because I think it's really pertinent to when we're talking about conservation in these um, conflict areas. And I was, uh, is this question around finance? And there's this conundrum, because a lot of the people that are heavily invested in, for example, the mining companies that fuel that kind of conflict are also the philanthropists that are funding African parks. So. I, it's a difficult question, but I mean, how, and these people fundamentally believe that investment in mining is the correct thing to do, and fundamentally believe that investment in this kind of crisis con conservation is also the right thing to do. And I know people in my own personal circles that, that hold these beliefs. So how, that, and that, that's like, how do, we, how do we grapple with this issue of financing mechanisms that really fuel this kind of conservation that's so violent? Okay, thanks. Let's take a few couple of questions. There was another hand somewhere. Okay. Thank you so much. My question is, uh, can we care for animals, people, nature, culture at the same time? And if in some places we cannot, what are the values that should guide our decision making? Okay. That goes to this group. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. So my question is directed to Tafadzwa in the research that she did. 
I just want to have more understanding on why it was only women who were collecting patch grass and what does that mean for their economic development. And then the other question um, is linked to what we're talking about the raids for hunters and the carpenters. So who were the informants and were you able to get information from those informants? What do they get out of it when they are giving information out that leads to the violence of others? Okay, thanks. Maybe we should uh, respond to these questions and we can take another round if there are any. Okay, Esther, you want to respond? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, great question, great question. So I think the violence is a form of conservation in conflict areas. Uh, it makes a big appeal to, to donors, like the European Commission, because there's a narrative that this also can contribute to peace building stability. In Eastern, um, in Eastern Congo, they have tried security sector reform. They have tried many things in Congo to stop uh, to stop the, the presence of the rebel groups in Eastern Congo. M many things failed, so there's all this hope put on conservation of also having these stab stabilizing and peace building effects, despite all the evidence pointing that it only aggravates violence and it actually uh, Excavates armed mobilization because rebel groups have now more fertile ground to mobilize people in their in their ranks so uh, But the image is strong the image is strong uh, It's also the failure of other options to deal with with insurgency to deal with the Sahel We are seeing now the same uh, the, 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 in, the, in the Sahel region people have French military operations haven't worked Maybe we should look to African parks. It's really, um, uh, 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 this is happening. And then on, on, on the big, the, 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 the mining companies and the private donors behind African parks, I think also it is because of the shock and awe, the images. If you see a mountain gorilla dead, and you put there, the, the, the images that are being created around this noble war, this noble war to save wildlife, and the images are very striking. And I think it really draws in us as the consumers of, of, of these images and even pro promotes a form of war tourism even. People want to see these, these heroes and it, they want to go to Eastern Congo now as tourists also to see this, this noble war and to contribute to it. It even creates really, it's, it's creating a, consuming, uh, uh, a consumer um, reaction as well, which is bit frightening, but uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, just <laughs> Okay, so, um, is it Ricky? Yes, okay. indeed. Uh, women are not allowed, okay, men are not allowed um, in, in the forest because uh, there's just this general, it's a trust issue really. Uh, because we know that traditionally hunting is, uh, is, is an activity for, you know, normally done by men, right? So there's this belief that if they go in uh, to access other resources, then they start watching out where they are going to start looking out where they're going to, you know, set their snares. And, you know, so that's just the main reason. And it's the same for firewood collection. So firewood collection is only done by women um, in Sikumen. It's only once a day, which is uh, Thursdays. It's actually called the Thursday policy, where men only, men, oh, sorry, women and girls only are allowed, not even boys. Women and girls only are allowed to, to get in. So it's just a matter of, um, of trust. It's a trust issue. And also just the, 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 the conception around men and hunting and you know that they will just be involved in those illegal. Because of all resources, bushmeat is illegal. So you can't even get a permit for it because it, it is illegal. It is illegal. Uh, uh, the Forest Act prohibits it, and then the Wildlife Act, which is read together with the Forest Act, also prohibits uh, wildlife. And then, in terms of informants, um, I didn't, I didn't get uh, a chance to to speak to any of the possible informants. But what I know is that uh, a local NGO that's operating in the area has funded a toll-free uh, toll-free line. So. Anyone in the community or those that identify themselves as informants will just pick up the phone and call and inform that, you know, I've seen some illegal activity. 
Um, so I've, I really don't know, and, and normally these things are so secret, and it should be, you know, the informants should not be known. But what it is done is to just, it is just caused um, disharmony in the, in the community, and there's also accusations of witchcraft, because imagine if I, if I hear that so and so might, might be the one that reported you to the forest guards resulting in the raid. Even if it's just hearsay, I'm, I'm going to take actions against that family. And if, I have, if you and uh, you, if we share the, a common enemy, then we are going to you know, just group up. So it's just chaos, it just creates this, uh, this harmony. Um, but it's a very good question and something that I think I, I might actually be interested in pursuing, like that, interested in pursuing, like who really are these informants and how do they work, how, what do they get out of it? But normally, if they're to get anything, I'd want to suspect it's just perhaps in exchange for contracts. Uh, I think I actually remember one of the guards saying that we, when there are contract jobs within the forest reserves, you know, we can hire those people that sometimes help us with information. So these contracts involve sometimes uh, fire management within, you know, just short contracts with very little money, really. Yeah. Together with uh, the question that was asked, you want to? A, a small contribution, it's a big question, really. But in, in the book, we started talking about or interrogating these binaries. And one of the issues we raised was about the ideology within conservation that promotes these binaries, humans and non-humans. And yet, if you look at quite a lot of uh, local populations, particularly indigenous groups, how they view, um, how they live in these spaces. You cannot make a divide. This is nature, culture, and so on. Amongst many um, black groupings, people are tied into their environments. There's this issue of your umbilical cord is buried where you are, you are born. That conjures up a relationship that's permanent. But conservation and these ideas from elsewhere disrupt these kind of relationships, complex relationships that people relate to their environment. We come up with these binaries, which are sometimes not really helpful in the way local populations relate to their environment. You heard this morning the um, talk from Cromwell, from Colobeni, yeah. In many communities are like that. Many uh, local populations are like that. They still have these strong ties to their spaces, which complicates, uh, which is, you know, conservation spaces or the way states deal with environments never come to terms with completely. Th that's my take, which we deal with in a small way towards the end of the book. But yeah, Manu, over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, we'll take a hand up there. Um, but we, yeah, I, I can just add one one point um, about that. The because we are thinking about how how black people are placed in the world, so, so we are sensitive to discussions about who should live with wildlife. <laughs> Actually, in 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 Zambia, where they were they're creating, um, when they were creating a national park. Um, and there were schools in a, play, in a place where they wanted to uh, translocate the rhinos um, into, into that area and, and bring in wildlife in the place. And, and then the story was, okay, in this place there were always animals, so they're just coming back. And they're coming back to live with you. Your grandparents lived with wildlife, so you should do the same. And because that was in the middle of the school, sorry, the school was in, in, in that place, kids stayed away from school. They were afraid of the, of the animals that were brought in the place. But they have to adjust to what will be seen as your tradition allows you to do that. And, and of course, the, there's a troubling question about who, 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 who should always live with the animals, even if they don't want to? Who else lives with the animals? 
And I think, I think humanity itself is not just this one thing. And, and we have got that sensitivity because we, we, we're dealing with, um, with, uh, with black lives here and, and, and how that is, how that is uh, co-opted into conservation narratives. And, and very often we, we, you know, we talk about local communities and this and that, but there, there's also a demography of those kind of people we're talking about. And, and, and so, so we grapple with that question. And, and of course, that's a discussion that should continue beyond the book. There was a hand up there. We can take that. Okay, there. Yes. There's Sorry, a hand we, up there. It's, yes. it's quite interesting. It, it relates also to uh, uh, a Zambian context, but it's, it's a bit broader. I was wondering, whether um, some findings also from uh, historically interested social anthropological research um, is related to in the book. Um, th there's actually a lot of evidence that uh, specifically regarding uh, hunting in many African contexts, um, local groups before colonial times had clear rules and regulation how to govern uh, you know, wildlife and how to, how to hunt, how hunting was used. For instance, uh, in Zambia, in the southern province, there was uh, an institution called Chila Hunting, where three or four times a year local groups were gathering and coordinating the culling of, of uh, lechway antelopes and then distributing the meat. It was clearly regulated, you know. And that was working fine because when the first colonizers came, the whole area, this is in the Kafir Flats in southern uh, province in Zambia, was actually full of wildlife, you know. It was the land of milk and honey. And now with all these sort of, uh, you know, violence of conservation that took place uh, now, there's, there are no animals anymore. So also these violent conservation strategies are not working and previous rules and regulations were working. So I was wondering, it also uh, relates to what Frank has been saying. Is that somehow reflected in the book? Because you were mentioning, you know, non-violent strategies and this ample research, I mean, we compared the Kafir Flats with six other um, African floodplain areas where we saw similar pre-colonial institutions to govern what could be called common pool resources or the wildlife commons, which were actually quite well done, you know, and now uh, it's, it's a complete disaster, which again, of course, justifies this violent sort of conservation, but this violent conservation will not lead to conservation. I mean, it will be a failure because all these animals will, will go away. So are you sort of anticipating these sort of local uh, solutions to, to actually this conservation issue? Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, there are two... may, may I just, while, while yes. I have the mic moving down, follow up very quickly, uh, because the raging debate about zoonotic diseases must have some important connectivity. I don't know if it's in the book, but with uh, a lab leak theory circulating now about COVID, uh, and a stronger, more durable critique of capitalist penetration of Central Africa for COVID, for bats and pangolins, for uh, AIDS, for Ebola, all in, up in the air. Uh, I'm curious whether anybody in the panel has, has worked out uh, what kind of politics we'd like. Is it the, is it the sort of Marxist theory of a Rob Wallace uh, of the zoonotic disease penetrating with, with markets and pressures is it uh, the eco-health, one health approach, more apolitical? Just curious if that's on your radar screen. Who is next? Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm, my name is uh, Felipe Milanes. I come from Brazil. Uh, I, I'd like to congratulate you. I'm really interested in, in reading the book. And now that you are explained a bit more, I could read like the violence of conservation in African diaspora. Uh, in thinking about the recent violence in the past years against black communities in rural areas in Brazil, also in Colombia, but in Brazil taking account like private conservation intentions of large landowners who are buying piece of land away from their, their original farms to supposedly protect and they are increasing violence against Quilombo and other black communities, but I'm also seeing the same in, uh, in, 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 in Colombia. So this is very inspiring to exchange uh, ideas, I, I imagine. And I would like to ask you concerning the alternatives, because you mentioned uh, Gandhi and Luther King, and I, I'm sure like the, 
history of uh, the struggle of Chico Mendes and other rubber tapers to produce a different conservation, let's say, you know, and uh, has been very, can be exchanged. And in the case of Chico Mendes in Brazil, what, what I think was really interesting is that there was an alliance between the rubber tappers and indigenous people, let's say, to build a, a different type of uh, conservation and to defend the forest. Have you found here in Africa this kind of, let's say, alliances between different uh, populations and groups that they can face together the dispossession and other violence of conservation? Is there examples in, in that, that sense? Okay, thanks. We'll take the last question. Uh, Anvesha, uh, I'm Anvesha, yeah. Thank you so much for that panel. I just had a quick uh, question because this is uh, violence of conservation in Africa, which is a continent with, you know, and your book covered so many of these different countries with different uh, colonial trajectories with current forms of governance. And when you talk about black people, which black people and how do they affect these different groups of black people? And if you found certain emerging patterns and that you see going forward forward in terms of these violent conservation landscapes. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, um, anybody who wants to take a bite quickly? We, we're running out of time. <laughs> um, I, can, I can start with the last question, um, which, which is, you know, black people. So um, in, in, in this country, we use black as a generic uh, term. And, and we, thought, we thought we would use that to, to begin to open up a discussion on how this violence manifests in other places. And actually the example of Brazil that you have just mentioned, I mean, we have learned a lot from, from Brazil, not only from the Amazon and the struggles, where violence is actually against people who are defending the, the forest. So, so it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very difficult, it's a very different, you know, the, the, the nature, what is it, they're called defenders, you know, they, they're the defenders of, of, of nature. And those are the people who are being killed, okay, because they're defending the forest against, against your, your, your logging companies. Um, but, but again, you know, who, who are those people? We, we would we would classify them in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the concept of, of, of black. Um, and, and we know that concept doesn't include everything we want there, but, but it's, it's, a start, you know, it's a concept we found useful um, for, for, for our discussions on the continent. But it does apply to, um, to other regions of the world. Um, I think the Brazilian part was a comment. Um, and um, there was another question. Um, uh, your, your, your point, uh, sorry, I'm dominating the, the, but that's what happens when you're chatting the meeting. Um, the, the, the point that um, about, about uh, zoonotics and, and so forth, it's, 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 an, it's an important one. Because we also know the politics of diseases where, you know, People have, have, have been, I mean, in some of the areas that are in conservation spaces now, you sort of, you know, inject diseases there and, and get people out of, the, out of the way. Now, what happens when, when, when you, you have got these companies that, um, of course, need medicinal plants and all this? So there's quite a lot of investment from the health sectors. We don't go deeper into that part. Um, we, 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 we have referred to it in the geopolitics of, of, of nature conservation. Uh, but that discussion on the geopolitics uh, has been taken in, in other papers, not inside the book. But we do, we do refer to that. And that's, that's one of the line of inquiry that I think will be quite useful. Especially where you have got your superpowers uh, contesting control of, our, of Africa. I mean, the, the, the Central African Republic is a critical part for that, uh, where the Russians are there, where the Chinese are coming, and, and everybody is contesting. But, but we know that um, in that, in that uh, quest for control over, over the areas, they, they, you know, I don't want to think of tourists as the carriers of the diseases, 
But we have learned from COVID that actually that's what happens when people are traveling around a lot. But you could also um, decimate populations uh, willingly because you want that space. And, and that is the kind of political ecology we perhaps haven't grappled with as we should. Um, I'm being mindful of the time now, so that's why. But anybody who wants to say anything there? To Bayer's point, it's, it's, yes is the simple answer, but <laughs> we, we don't deal directly as much as you did in the way you uh, posted your work in, in Zambia and uh, flood plans elsewhere. Because, yeah, you know, we, we deliberately were evocative and trying to share ideas of where we are at, but this would be probably secondary stuff we may need to follow up on. And, and thank you for that suggestion. Okay, thank, thank you very much. I've, we've run out of time, but we can say the previous uh, session took some time from us. Uh, um, but I think it's time to end this conversation and continue it in other formats. Um, so I want to ask you to join me in thanking the, the, the panelists for, for these uh, sessions.